բարիերը գոս իրերիկ պարեկամներ։ Այսօրվա մեր հյուրն է հատնի պժիշ, որ ուաս կանգոսի 30 դիստրիկեն գնձա տեգնացույ է, եվ իդի խոսինք իր հետը մասմա անգլերը նսենք, մասմա հայերեն, բայց մենլի անգլերեն, որ ավելի Why would I run for Congress? Um, I ask people, are you happy with how things are right now? No, nobody's happy. Would you like them to change? Yes, of course. Are you going to be the one who changes them? The voters are the one, not me. Correct. So that's why I'm doing it, because I've had enough. Chop on sav, ameknis pavagan unet sadzink, anor hamar, si masnak tsim, ais andrutian, vorbes teknadzu. Well, this district is mainly Democrats, right? Um, it's the 30th district where the current incumbent is, is a Democrat. Yes. He's running for U.S. Senate. Correct. So I'm running for Adam Schiff's spot. Uh, yeah, exactly. He's running for Senate. The, by the numbers, 54% of the district is Democrats. Right. 15% is registered Republican. 25% is no party preference. Independent. Independent, yes, okay. not registered. Um, but I always say that California is not a liberal state. California is a libertarian state, hmm. meaning we're all about personal responsibility, <clears throat> rugged individualism, and the only thing standing in your way of being a success is how hard you're willing to work. Um, so I call myself a Duke Majin Republican. So you're a Republican? I'm a Republican, yes. You're running for a seat that has 54% Democrats. Yes. So the numbers are against you? The numbers are with me. Uh, the numbers are with me. The How? district, The district is 25% Armenian. Okay. And I say 25% Armenian, but only 20% voter turnout. So I always say Armenians are closet Republicans. What do we believe in? Number one, family and the home. Number two, education for the kids. Number three, work. Make something for yourself and leave it to your family. Conservative values. Conservative values, yes. And I was born George Duke Mejanin had yes, Metsa Hos Glendel Zenads Metsads Gertabats. You're a local kid. You was born you're a local kid. I was born in Glendale. So I said you could Glendale Armenian. You Glendale Armenian. You couldn't be Armenian in California in the 80s and not be a Republican, not be a Duke Major Republican. That is what I am. But Armenians shifted drastically. I remember what you're saying, yes. that Armenians were Republicans, we have a Republican governor yep. who's Armenian descent. Everything was so Republican. Even the whole California shifted now drastically into Democrats. I'll tell you why. Two reasons, two big reasons. Uh, number one was the influx of Armenians from Hayastan okay. in the mid-90s, late 90s. Um, and the differences in being in a communist <coughs> state versus a uh, you know, Middle Eastern state where you have a dictatorship, the government would run everything for you. So when they came to this country, and the first thing that they hear is that Newt Gingrich and the Republicans in 1994 are going to cut Social Security, are going to cut Medicare, are going to cut welfare, then they come with the understanding that these Republicans, whoever they are, are not going to take <coughs> care of the average person. So that is number one, mm -hmm. the influx of people they were taught to dislike Republicans. But they can't vote this influx of new people. I'm sorry? They're, they cannot vote. They, they're but just immigrants. They're How immigrants, are they going to vote? But eventually they're not they, citizens yet. Eventually they could vote. Okay. So they were conditioned to think that the Republicans were bad. In the 2000s with Bush and Cheney, and this is why I call myself a disenfranchised Republican, because my Republican Party, which was the party of lower spending, smaller government, suddenly became the party where we'll invade every country, we'll take their natural resources, we will leave that country in ruin, and we will drive up our national debt with all of these wars. So for the last 20 years, I have been a disenfranchised Republican because the Republican Party that I grew up with pro-small business, lower government, lower taxes, lower spending, responsible spending, that party left me. So I'm here to bring it back to me. So those are your principles yes. that you're trying to run? Basically for, speaking, uh, I say, 
keep my streets clean, keep my neighborhood safe, stay out of my checkbook, stay out of my family life. And that's the format. That is it. You're running. Yeah. How are you going to win the seat? Easily. Okay. Tell okay. us how. Tell you how. I'm, I'm ready to hear it. Yes. Uh, so I am the only Republican running against 16 Democrats at last okay. count. So that 54% Democrats is going to be divided a lot. Um, the top two of the 16 candidates or 17 candidates for March. We'll end up to the final. We'll end up to the final. So this is why it's very important for me to say to the Armenians, March 5, 2024 will be an important date. It is the only opportunity in our lifetime, because Adam Schiff has been here for 22 years. The seat is open for the first time in 22 years. It'll be the only opportunity in our lifetime to elect an Armenian representative for the largest Armenian district in the country to be in the Armenian caucus. Right now, we're relying on Odars right. to represent us in the Armenian caucus. Why can we not have an Armenian to represent 100%. us in the Armenian caucus? I'm in agreement with you on right. that point that we should have an Armenian person, one of our own, mm. as opposed to relying on Adam Schiff and others you know, who are pro-Armenian, but still, it's better to see one of our own Correct. people there in, in that seat. Clearly that, that... But how... Out of the 16, mm -hmm. some of, I don't know all these 16, but some of them are prominent uh, people in our community. They are. And uh, they're raising a lot of money. They are. Uh, how are you going to compete against that? So at the end of the day, it's not how much money you raised, but how many votes you got. Right. So I want to be that guy, that very tight-fisted guy who gets outspent 10 to 1 and still wins the election. So are you going to go door to door? We have been going door to door. And telling, hey, I'm Alex, I'm running for mm -hmm. Congress, yes. please vote, support yep. me. I speak to them in English, in Armenian. I go and I introduce myself. Um, and we are very grassroots. I think our average donation is about $215. Okay. So we don't have these thousands of dollar donations that people are giving. So people with smaller increments. Small increments. Um, and I've calculated we need to make it the top two, again, you're not guaranteed to have one Republican, one Democrat. It's an open could primary. could be two Democrat or one Democrat independent in your case. Correct. Well, I'm, so I started as an independent, um, but then no name, no party, no support. So you're a Republican. I'm re I've, yes. After about two months, I said, I need to do this as a Republican. So I'm doing it, again, still as a disenfranchised Republican. But we've calculated if I get 60,000 votes, that will guarantee me first or second place. Mm. Can I find 60,000 Armenians in Glendale and Burbank? Well, by sheer population, yes, we yes. have 60,000 Armenians. But will we Do have... they vote? Correct. I don't know. That's another point. Correct. So Get to vote. Will I find 60,000 <clears throat> Armenians who vote? So my biggest opponent is not going to be Laura Friedman. My biggest opponent is not going to be Anthony Portentino. My biggest appointment is going to be Armenian disengagement. Armenians, we love to complain. We love to say things, but as far as action, we don't vote. What about Armenian organizations? Are they supporting you or? No. Why not? Um, the same party has no choice. No, no chance. No chance. And so if you were to back a candidate, you would ideally support that candidate based on their values, based on their platform, not on their chances of winning. So if there is a person who is popular, but not the right person for you, like Portantino is very popular among mm -hmm. Armenians. Right. And through the years, he's done a lot for Armenians. I mean, How so? Well, he was instrumental. I mean, again, I don't know the details, but from what I could see, he attends every Armenian event that uh -huh. I see him there. Right. He was instrumental getting some funds for the Armenian Museum. Okay. I mean, so those are important things for Armenians, uh -huh. to have a museum there. Again, I'm not his campaign manager. Right. I'm not defending him. So I just want to say I, I have no... Uh, position on him. But if somebody like that who's been always pro-Armenians for the Armenian organization, they're going to support him as opposed to someone they don't know. They so don't know you, right? They you, you new kid on the block. So they don't speak. know me. So let's talk about Anthony Portantino. Sure. Um, so have, do you know or do you know what's going on with these school board protests in Glendale with the parents? Yes, I've been, I'm, I'm going to ask you about that, but I'm glad you mentioned it. Yes. So All I graduated right. from Hoover High School. I went to public high school. I was able to go to UCLA. I was able to go to medical school. I became a success story because back You're then, so 30 years ago. As an Armenian-American. 
Yes, and back then, 30 years ago, a public school education opened doors. Right. Now, this year, only 24% of high school students, Hoover High School students, can do basic math graduating. Did we do them a favor? No. no. Are the parents justified in feeling upset and protesting that their children cannot do multiplication, but they can tell you the 52 different genders and pronouns that they can pick? So parents have been trying to express themselves, trying to hold the school district accountable. The school district has blocked them. And in fact, what they did was they recruited Anthony Portentino to write a law in Sacramento that said any parent who goes to a school board meeting and says something that alarms or annoys someone, and that's in the wording, and if you alarm or annoy somebody, that is a misdemeanor and a $1,000 fine. So as a parent speaking out and saying, why is my child not learning? And if that upsets somebody at the school board, that's a $1,000 fine and a misdemeanor, that law passed. Governor Newsom vetoed it. But what does that say to Armenian I'm parents? Governor, I'm surprised that he didn't sign it. He, he didn't sign it because he has his eye on the presidency and he wants to do certain things. Um, but if you say, what has Anthony Portentino done for Armenian parents lately? He has tried to shut them up. He has tried to make them criminals. I don't want to have that man represent me and my neighbors in Washington. Laura Friedman. Okay, let's talk about Laura Friedman. Laura Friedman wrote um, a, a law to mandate the HPV vaccine for all California schoolgirls age 8, 9, and 10. Mandate. Parents don't have the choice about it. I am a physician. First, do no harm. Of Second, course. do not violate patient autonomy. If I think that you need a vaccine, it is my responsibility to tell you, Mike, this is, you know, the benefits are much higher than the risks. You really should do this. And it's up to me to it's make up that to decision. You. Yes, I don't control your decision. I simply advise you. What Laura Friedman did was take that right away from people. You do not do that. You do not violate patient autonomy. Both Anthony Portentino and Laura Friedman passed a law in 2020 that prevented me as a physician from saying something about COVID that was different from what the government was saying. So if I said, oh, the, the initial vaccine, you should get the booster. If you're healthy, I don't think you need the booster. But because that was against what the Democrats and Gavin Newsom were saying, I was going to have my medical license revoked. If you advise the patient. If I advise the patient against what the government was saying. That law was passed. Both of them voted yes for it. And that law was quietly repealed this year, a couple of months ago. So they took away my right as a physician. Laura Friedman took away parents' rights to decide for their daughters yes or no for a vaccine. I don't want her in Congress on my behalf. So what is your platform? What are you running? As I know you're running as a Republican now. Uh -huh. What is your platform? What are you going to do for us? Because I'm one of your uh, constituents, uh, constituents in, voters, in, in, yes. future, I should say, yep. because I live in Glendale. Uh -huh. So what are you going to do for me? So what I'm going to What's do in it for me, so to speak? So, I don't want to be selfish, yep. but as a voter, I have a right to know. Of course. So I am here, again, fiscally conservative, socially Perfect. moderate. Well, how do you fix the federal government budget? So, it's just been out of control. We have tri $32 tri trillion dollar debt. We correct, have. yes. So I think we should run the country like we run our own households, on a budget and with minimal interference from outside forces. So one thing I will never do when I'm in Congress, I will never vote for deficit spending. The budget so you will should be, balance budget. The, the budget will be balanced. We are going to pay off our debt like good people, like good citizens. That is why our dollar is worth nothing, because our government treats it as if it's worth nothing. And so how am I going to rule? So I'm going to have balanced budget. That's number one. Number two, I will not cut Social Security, Medicare. What will I cut? But how are you going to do it? How, how will I, I mean, do Social Security and Medicare is almost one third of the budget. Correct. We have borrowing, we have to pay interest on it. Uh -huh. We have national defense. Right. So where is the money going to come? So do you so know that- Should we increase taxes? Uh, no, I do not want to increase taxes. So where is the money coming from? For example, do you know that Adam Schiff voted in 2020 to give $120 million to Turkey via NATO? with weapons, fighter jets, etc. 
those weapons, drones, fighter jets, found their way through the back door to Azerbaijan, and that is what Aliyev used to attack Artsakh. But nobody knows in the Armenian community. No, He's no. a hero. He supports Armenian issues. I am here. I am here to tell them that if they look at, and this is available data, it is not hiding. It is there if you look it up. But people just don't want to know. So that would be a good starting point. That $120 million that was sent to Turkey via NATO, I would cut it out. Most of these... Um, how are you going to cut it out? They're going to say, Defense Department, State Department, is going to say, we need it for NATO. But uh, a NATO uh, ally. I mean, is a NATO ally. An ally so when, uh, when uh, Erdogan says that if we choose the wrong side in this Israel-Palestine fight, he will attack the United States. What ally of ours speaks to us like this? They are not our friend. We know that. Right. How do you convince that to the American public? Well, what you, what you tell them is you tell them exactly what they've been saying, how they will attack us if we act a certain way, number one. Our allies that we're giving money and weapons to should never tell us that they will attack us. That's Nobody like a, should attack the United States. That's like your own dog biting you. If yeah. your own dog bites you, you kick the dog out. Also, what I tell Americans is Turkey came into NATO in 1956. At that time, it had a unique position. It was right next to Russia when there were a lot of Eastern European countries within the Soviet Union. It also had access to the Black Sea. Now, immediately adjacent to Russia, you have Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Black Sea access. You, you have Romania, Bulgaria. You have multiple places. <clears throat> Turkey is no longer unique. If you're going to speak the way you do and we can replace you, we will. We're going to take a break. Once we take back, we'll talk about your campaign. Of course. How you're going to pursue this thing to win. At the end, winning is everything. Seher Payegamler, Gaj Tatar mı bir de Arnek ye? Bir de Berat Arnak mı? Hayda Kriyim. Dear Paigamner, I saw Mayor Hürne, Dr. Alec Palikiana, or U.S. Congress, Yeresunar District, or Glendale, or Mayor Shirchanne, Tegnatsuye from Republican Party. So, Mayor Kurachink, or I saw Mayor Miyatsa, we've had a Gazuru Tsink. Just before the break, we were talking about these bigger issues. But more importantly, how are you going to win this race? Because the key is winning it. It's a, it's been a district, Democrat has it for 22 years, as you said. Yep. I mean, Rogan, there was a guy that... Jim Rogan, Rogan yes. Jim Rogan, he yep. was a Republican. That was my first uh, election that I voted, and Jim Rogan Jim lost. Jim Rogan, he yes. lost that election. I remember yes. that 20 <laughs> years ago. Somehow it came to my mind now. So he was the Republican yep. at this district. Mm -hmm. Heavily Armenian, as you said, 24%. Uh, big Armenian population. Yep. Uh, we'd love to see an Armenian winning, but why is the Armenian organization not supporting? That's, that's to me, uh, because once you're an Armenian, I would think the Armenian organization should support you. But I guess it doesn't work that way. Uh, it doesn't work that way, and we've been doing this campaign so far by ourselves, and we will continue to do it by ourselves if other people aren't going to support us. Because we're not doing this for an organization, we're doing this for everybody in the district. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why we are going to be successful is two reasons. Number one, everybody's had enough. So our campaign slogan has become, enough. Have you had enough of the $6 gas? Have you had enough of paying through the nose to live here, only to see homeless people on the sidewalk? Have you had enough of small businesses going bankrupt, closing their doors because thieves do smash and grabs, and the police catch them but nobody prosecutes them? Have you had enough of paying higher taxes and higher prices for goods and all your money is being sent over across the globe to foreign dictators who then attack your own countrymen? So a lot of, have you had enough of your children's education being full of things that don't matter. But what would, how would Congress deal with these issues? So, I mean, these are bigger issues you're raising, mm -hmm. which is important, but how would a member of Congress can affect this thing? Okay, excellent question. Um, so first thing, number one, let's talk about homelessness, 
Okay, okay. you see homeless people everywhere. California, Karen Bass, we spent $20 billion of our own money trying to house the homeless, and we just keep spending it, and it just keeps disappearing, and the homeless get more and more. Karen Bass keeps saying, it's a housing problem. No, Karen, it's a mental health problem. So we need to reopen the federal institutions. There are these people who are very mentally ill, yelling at the sky, schizophrenic. Those people need to be On placed, the streets, yeah. placed in institutions. They need to have their medications given to them. They need to improve. Then they need to go to sober living. So these other people who are not very severely mentally ill, but they have drug addiction. That is a mental illness. Just giving them a home is not going to fix the drug addiction because they're going to prioritize the drugs over taking care of themselves and taking care of that home. That is why you see all these hotels that Karen Bass buys. What do they do? They trash the place. So you need to have their sober living spaces that have aggressive substance abuse counseling, case management, and social work and follow-up. So follow-up. What makes drug treatment successful? Your family. 40% of California homeless aren't from here. Their families are elsewhere. Who ship from other states to here, probably. Either which, or a lot of them, you know, they say, they say, oh, they've been living here, and when they went homeless, you know, they were living in California. Yes, but they were maybe from Ohio, Missouri. They left their family. They had some differences. They came to California. They were in one apartment, living on somebody's couch, then became homeless. Why? Because of drugs. Mm -hmm. If you want those people to be successful, you send them home. So what would I do in Congress? Number one, open the federal institutions back up again for the severely mentally ill. Put them in a mental institution. Put them in, in a mental institution until they're better, and then they can go to the outpatient clinics. Number two, the clinics, sober living. Don't just give them houses. Hire the therapists. Hire the social workers. Make sure they're successful. That's number two. Number three, these people, their families are going to keep them sober. You have to send them back. So in Congress, we can transport people from one state to the other. Finally, finally, how can we expect these people to stay sober if our southern border with Mexico, if all of our ports, nobody's watching them, all the drugs are coming in? Congress needs to do its job. We need to close the border. There's so many things, not just people, but drugs coming in illegally from our borders. We need to shut down our borders. We need to fund the police to catch the people who come over illegally. That is how we make our neighborhoods clean and safe. Alex, have you done any uh, opinion polls, public opinion polls? Um, we, See how you're doing? We have not done any public opinion polls um, because they cost money and we are trying to raise money, but we don't have the big unions on our side giving us uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars like they do my opponents. Um, but we did see an opinion poll with some interesting information. Um, it was a poll from Mike Fewer's campaign, and it said that he was number one at 19% of, of people, voters, who uh, responded. Laura Friedman was at 18%. Um, Anthony Portantino was 11%, and I was just over 8%. Hmm. However, whoever did that poll left in the other two Republican candidates, Patrick Gibson, sheriff's deputy, and also Eric Sawchuk. He's a businessman from La Cunada. Mm. They pulled out two months ago and, and endorsed me. Oh. So if you take their numbers. It should be added to you. And, and when, you I mean, add it up, when you add it up, it's actually 20% of the vote. So I actually have the highest. So when, when the numbers are in our favor, number one, number two, a lot of different people, not just Republicans, independents, moderate Democrats, they're Democrats whose ch children are in school, and even they're saying, what are you teaching my kids? You know, why are you keeping things secret from me? But the other big reason we're going to win is I am the unique, moderate Republican candidate that everybody has been waiting for. So, so I, your approach is uh, it's not this uh, right wing, you know, very, uh, what's pushing the Republican Party nowadays? It's very, very like Trump type right. uh, people that, that pushing it, and he's winning. I mean. Clearly, that wing of the party is what's dominating the party. I mean, but so my whole thing is again, keep my taxes low, keep my streets right. safe, stay out of my house. Right. So one thing, one big thing, why the Republicans are losing is the abortion issue. Right. Okay. So are if, you in favor of abortion? The right. Fe the federal government does better when it gives us rights instead of taking it away. So when a woman is six weeks pregnant, 
what business is it of yours? That's between her and her family and her doctor. However, I am also a doctor. I work intensive care. I put people on life support to help them live. At 24 weeks, late term, a baby has a 50-50 chance of survival right. with life support. Of course. So if there's a baby who's 24 weeks or more, it is unethical of me to do anything to that baby that will intentionally make its chance of survival worse. Mm -hmm. So I am like the majority of Americans who believe that there shouldn't be a total ban, but you also shouldn't allow it up <coughs> until the very end, electively. So I'm like most Americans where late-term abortion, I think it is unethical, and we should not be doing it. Doctors should be counseled that it is not standard of care, but a woman who's six weeks, eight weeks pregnant. Different story. Different story, and the federal government should not stand in her way. That said, maybe California says, okay, we'll do it until 20 weeks. Colorado says we'll do it at six weeks. Different states will be different, and that is why you leave it up to the states. Right. Uh, what are other hot campaign issues in the district? So other hot campaign issues, money, the economy. Okay. okay. Um, so people are just upset that things are costing more, the dollar is worth less, we have $6 gas, electricity Why is through is the, the roof. Why is the gas so expensive in California? So the gas is so expensive. Because I have hospitals in other states, yep. in Midwest, um, uh, the, I mean in the, in the South, mm -hmm. uh, it's substantially less. Yes. Like $2 less. Correct, yes. It's barely $4, 3 something. Right. I mean, I was in Texas, I have a hospital in Dallas. Mm -hmm. That, that is 330, yes. 325. So it's, it's several reasons, okay, mm -hmm. but three big reasons. Number one, the gas tax, okay? okay. We have at least $1.50 of gas tax. Interestingly, Laura Friedman was presented a bill. She was the chair of the Transportation Committee in Assembly. So in July, she was given a bill to lower the gas tax temporarily for people to lower prices. She took it, hijacked it, and increased the gas tax. Instead of reducing Instead of, it. Gracias de Vagail. Like, I, I can't even believe it. Like, what was the rationale behind it? Why would she increase because it? Because California Democrats have an addiction to spending. They are raising our taxes. They are raising our property it's tax. It's not their money. That's the reason they're spending. Yes, they, it's not their money, but they love, they're addicted to spending. So our gas is high, num well, number one, because of a tax. Number two... California has a specific recipe for the gas that we have to have here, just because it burns cleaner, because we have yeah. the, all these environmental regulations. When I was growing up, I had asthma. Air quality was very bad in the 80s. I get it. Environmental regulations improved things. But lately, yeah. over the last 10 or 15 years, our, uh, clean the, air. The, the more regulations we've had have not translated into better health outcomes for people. In fact, in the last two years, California health outcomes have gotten worse. Mm. So you need to balance your environmental regulations. Why are we doing this? We're doing this to make people healthy. Well, if people's health isn't improving, we shouldn't keep doing all these new environmental regulations. So the type of gas, the recipe that we have, not every refinery makes it. So we have a very limited number of vendors that we can get it from. Finally, number two, number three, sorry, the California refineries that can make it, we've shut down about two-thirds of them. So you want to talk supply and demand, California has created for itself a supply-demand yeah. mismatch. So we've created for itself. So this problem is our own creation. Okay. You know, maybe you should have run for a more local position mm -hmm. as opposed to Congress. Right. You see, there's a lot of these issues we're raising, they're yep. local issues. So the, the uh, reason... I, I'm just for the first... I mean, when you start, let's say, you start residency. Uh -huh. After that, you just take your job. Yep. After that, you get the next job. Mm -hmm. You see, step by step, as opposed to going all the way to Congress. Yes. I mean, I'm just asking that question to you. Yes. Would it make sense for you to run all the way to Congress? It makes sense. Like Trump, he said, I want to run for president. He's never run any other office. Right. <coughs> Um, so it, may, it makes absolute sense. So in CrossFit, we say go big or go home. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so that, that's number one, go big or go home. Um, I, you know, the first time this seat has been open in 22 years, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and I'm taking it. And especially because the people that I saw registering as candidates, mm -hmm. I don't agree with their policies. I think we as the Republican Party can get a moderate candidate like me to do better. And I said the time is right because many people are upset at many different things. Number two. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. 
Number two, California Assembly. So you say, okay, why don't you go for a state assembly or right. state senate? The Democrats have a supermajority. So one seat isn't going to make a difference. Make okay. And why would this seat make a difference? Well, everybody knows AOC. They've heard of her name. Everybody knows Matt Gates from Florida. These young people are one person out of 435. How does everybody know their name? Marjorie Taylor Greene. Marjorie Taylor Greene. Right. Yeah. People know their name because they have exploited social media to their advantage. So are you using social media? We are using social media, yes. Um, and so this is why we've been very good because it's been building steadily. We have a very big social media presence. I have an excellent team working behind me doing this. But can you imagine a seat like this, Adam Schiff's seat, a safe democratic seat for 22 right. years, going to a no-name, non-politician, moderate, lifelong Duke Majin Republican? We're going to be headline news overnight. Oh, nationwide news, and if that happens. Yes, correct. of course. And this is why when right. I say, look, I did it, it's not that hard. You just have to work overtime. Do you have, do you have the time? In we, this I make the schedule time. I make that the time. you have, busy pulmonologist, critical care, are you going to go knock on each door saying, hey, I'm Alex uh, Balikian, so what for me? No, so we, uh, so I, in answer to your question, I am running my medical practice at the same time that I run this campaign. So I have a full-time job bringing in my money. And a full-time running uh, for uh, public office. Correct, and I have a full-time second unpaid job running for office. Mm. Um, but yes, I'm knocking on doors. So when I'm here and when I'm not working, I am knocking on doors. We are looking for volunteers. Is that the camera where I can t talk to them? Yeah. Yeah, we, we are looking for volunteers. So please at home, parents, uh, you know, we'll take you, we'll take your high school, college students. Anybody who would like to volunteer for us, please go to our website, www.alex4ca30.com. And you can sign up, and we need volunteers to help uh, call people, to send emails, and to knock on doors. Gee, we're endorsing you unofficially, so Thank we're giving you. you the platform, <laughs> even though it's so a nonpartisan type thing. Mm. Uh, because I know a lot of the people are running, too, so I have to be fair to everybody sure. just from that perspective. But we certainly would love to see an Armenian, uh, and also Armenian uh, Republican, right. in, because I'm a Republican myself yep. uh, all my life. So... Um, what is your final thoughts? We're almost at the end of mm -hmm. our show. I want to give you the final chance to make your case okay. to the public. I mean, the voters that, yeah. that they say, hey, vote for me. But, you know, it's, it's not enough, yeah. let's say, to say, hey, I'm Armenian, vote for me. You know, yeah. I, I'll give you that chance to you. Thank you. And I'll, and I'll speak directly to your audience. So this is a once-in-a-lifetime chance. This is the first time in 22 years that Adam Schiff has left this seat and there is no sign that the person who's going to go in isn't going to stay another 20, 30 years and be like Dianne Feinstein and die in office. This is a once-in-a-lifetime <laughs> opportunity. So we say, as our campaign strategy, enough is enough, but it's become now or never. I am the moderate candidate that everybody has been waiting for. I am not the loud progressive. I am the level-headed pragmatist. I am about Armenian and generally immigrant values. Number one, first comes family in the household. Number two, second comes education for the children. Number three, work hard, make something of yourself, and leave something for your family. So there is urgency, there is importance. We need to show up and vote March 5, 2024, and then again in November. I want to do my job, but I cannot do it if you don't do your job and vote first. Alex, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate it. We wish you well. I hope Armenians, uh, Armenian Americans, I should say, support you. Mm -hmm. And we sure need an Armenian in our district to represent us. I mean, as I said, I know all the people that are running, Friedman and uh, Portantino and others. I know them personally quite well. But I, obviously, my preference will be a fellow Armenian Thank you. and fellow healthcare person mm -hmm. on top of it. So we wish you well. Thank you, Mike. And uh, we will end our show. Sirey Payegamner, Aysebo Geberçatsenek, Mer Haydakira, Gebmek Gemaktın Alex Balikyan'ın Haça Uçuyun, Orbes Yerasun Erot District Congress'ın Nergi Atöz İçilla, Yev İçbesiz Al Mardin, Martin'in İren Botunek, Anşuş Menk Bu Evi Endosman Çengener, Bayt Kaçalarek Bormer Hay Yekbarnere Kuyurere Kaçalarek Hayyuma, Kişer Parih.